Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all for joining us online this afternoon for what is the 18th webinar in our Data Science in the News series, um, jointly hosted by the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Queensland University of Technology's Centre for Data Science. My name is Helen Chenery, and I'm president of the Queensland Academy. I'm joining you from the foothills of Mount Kutha this afternoon, which is the ancestral lands of the Turrbal and the Yagara peoples. And I acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. And wherever you're joining us from this afternoon, we recognize that these lands have been places of healing, teaching, kinship and family and creation for many thousands of years. And we pay respect to elders past and present. Our webinar today focuses on aged care, and I think we can all agree that it's been in the news lately. Certainly following the publication last month of the long awaited report from the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. And what a report, um, five volumes, thousands of pages, 147 major recommendations, which all make up for very somber reading. With recurring themes describing the many flaws, failures and shortfalls, which in the commissioner's opinions can only be addressed through fundamental reform, because in their words, mere adjustments and improvements are not sufficient. A profound shift is required. The report identifies some positive foundations and new interdisciplinary approaches that we can that can be used for this requisite rebuilding of the aged care system. So what can we do today in an hour? Well, today we've invited four expert panelists from the disciplines of geriatric neuropsychology, economics, geriatric psychiatry, and nutrition and dietetics to speak about what they see might be a future for aged care looking through a data science lens. And whilst data science is central to the insights and commentary today, we know that at the heart of this discussion are people, men and women who are seeking care and whose lives are changed as a result of needing additional or different care as they age. We know and acknowledge that their families and communities are impacted in many different ways also. So, with this front of mind, can I introduce to you, firstly, Professor Nancy Pahana, Professor of Clinical Geropsychology and Co-Director of the Aging Mind Initiative at the University of Queensland. Welcome, Nancy. Lovely to have you on board. Great to be here. Professor Luke Connolly, who's the Professor of Health Economics at the Centre for the Business and Economics of Health at the University of Luke of University of Luke, God, you're not that good yet, Luke, <laughs> at the University of Queensland. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Helen. Um, welcome to Associate Professor Steve McFarlane, Head of Clinical Services, the Dementia Centre, Hammond Care, and Associate Professor of Aged Psychiatry at Monash University. Hi, Steve. Helen, thanks for the invitation. And finally, Professor Liz Eisenring, who's Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics, at Bond University and owner of Link Nutrition. So a warm welcome to all our panelists. Thank you. Now just a little bit about what today will look like. Each of our experts have been given about six to seven minutes to provide a glimpse into the aged care landscape from their disciplinary perspective. And while they're doing that, you, the viewers, can use the Q&A channel on this Zoom session to comment and to ask questions. And after all our panelists have presented, I'll then put these questions to them and look forward to hearing their insights. So let's get started. The report of the Royal Commission rightly addresses care provided by staff in residential facilities. But does community have a role here as it did in generations past? And is this an approach that might deliver on the report's imperative to put the person first? 
So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Nancy Pahana, to tell us more about care in the community. Thanks, Nancy. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and it's a pleasure to present today. And I'm going to say that this is such an opportunity to refocus what has been such a um, really confronting report by the Royal Commission and really take up the challenge of reframing and reconceptualizing how we might take aged care forward. And in my presentation, I'll be talking about how community, individuals, and connection can really make that happen. So COVID has really underscored something that I think we took for granted, the ability to connect and freely mix with people. And in aged care, it's no different. People in aged care would have family visit, have friends visit, have a really open ability to find connection. But that has really been stymied by COVID. People have experienced lockdowns, have been unable to connect, have had to wrestle if they were even given the opportunity to connect via devices or over the internet in what may have been an entirely unfamiliar manner. And so there's a real hunger for connection and particularly the connection of, of being with another person and having that person acknowledge your own uniqueness and special selfhood. In response to the Royal Commission, many people have um, come forward with uh, really a prece of how to take these recommendations and make a fundamental change. A lot of community groups have spoken as one about important points in the report, and many have seen um, the sort of a summary about basic legal aspects of the act or greater transparency. But I draw your attention to the very last line, better integration of other health and well-being services with aged care. It's my belief that there are existing community resources that could be very well integrated into the aged care experience to increase the health and well being of all people in aged care, irrespective of physical or cognitive um, limitations. These quotes are directly taken from the Royal Commission's report, and they speak to the vital role that the community has to play in aged care going forward. Um, the community has a role in supporting people, supporting people to live well in later life, involves keeping people socially connected. The empirical data on the strength of social connections and their direct impact on morbidity and mortality, and specifically risk of dementia, has been clearly demonstrated in numerous studies. But social connection also has a two-way benefit. It benefits people within the community. And we know that intergenerational contact also has an empirical uh, support uh, for enriching both younger and older people. And just because people are in aged care does not mean that that link needs to be broken. Finally, and this is to me a very powerful sentence, People should not feel cut off from life as they knew it before they moved into residential aged care. And so often that move to residential aged care is a sundering of important relationships in the community and an important sense of identity. And this I feel can be addressed by increased access to community resources um, that could be marshaled to help the person maintain a sense of efficacy, a sense of themselves, um, and, and really benefit mental and physical well being. So, there are a lot of things I could talk about, and some, some small things are already in place, but I would like to be bold and say that one thing that should be considered is an initiative that has been very successful in the UK, which is called social prescribing. Social prescribing is a means for healthcare professionals, particularly general practitioners, to connect patients with community-based non-clinical services 
um, that are meant to augment physical, mental, spiritual, social well-being. The real strength of social prescribing is its attempt to tailor community resources to the older person, to what that person's essential, unique self is. How does this take place? The most common setting for social prescribing has been general practice, but general practice plays a key role in aged care. It involves conversation between the patient and the healthcare practitioner to settle on a community resource that the older person would feel comfortable or is interested in. And then the, prescrip the prescription is generated, the link is made, and then there are follow-ups to see how the person is progressing with that link. How might this play out in the Australian landscape? Well, I'll give a couple of examples, all of which are underpinned by an empirical um, data set in terms of their being uh, tried in community settings. The first is an example from Ireland, and uh, this is a, a community resource, Silver Thread, which helps older adults um, to formulate their memories, stories, life histories into a format that can be readily shared with friends or with the wider community. And I love this as a resource because it wouldn't matter if you were in lockdown. Um, it wouldn't matter um, because you don't have to actually go anywhere. This is all done online. And this group has produced um, short story compilations and historical compilations that really have given a sense of efficacy to the older adults that have participated. A more homegrown example is uh, at the RSPCA where um, there's a program, Happy Paws, Happy Hearts, which brings animals to, uh, which brings people to the animals, I'm sorry, uh, in the RSPCA facilities, allowing them to interact with the animals and um, it allows the animals to, to be adopted earlier and it gives the people a sense of uh, efficacy and well-being. And this is currently uh, a subject of a study that I'm part of. And finally, there's the Queensland Ballet, which has had a long-standing uh, program, uh, Senior Ballet, that has had a recent publication. It was spearheaded by people from uh, researchers from QUT. But they're very keen to bring their ballet format into um, aged care settings. Um, they already have ballet programs for people living with dementia and people with Parkinson's disease. So in sum, I think that this is a means of really closely connecting a huge range of community resources to people in an aged care context for the benefit of health and well-being. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Wow, you, you make a very compelling case for consideration of social prescribing. And what I really love about it is that it absolutely speaks to the uh, mandate of the Commission's report, which is putting the person first. So thank you. Um, I imagine that along with um, your, your own suggestions, there'll be many innovative um, models of care proposed as a result of the, the Commission's report. And one of the major um, questions that follows them, looking at you now, Luke, is how do we fund them? The Parliamentary Budget Office has projected that over the next decade, Australian government spending on aged care will increase 4% a year, correcting for inflation. This is the key part that 4% will be more than the average rate of all government spending combined, which is 2.7%. Hmm. So I'm looking forward to hearing Professor Luke Connolly speak to some of these funding challenges in aged care today and other matters. And it's a privilege to welcome him to speak with us today. Thanks, Luke. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, yeah, so I, I'll focus mostly on um, healthcare financing, as, as Helen has said. Um, sorry, aged care financing. And um, one of the things that is included in the aged, um, the Royal Commission's reporting was a, a report that was done by a group in Adelaide that consisted of a very large study of 10,000, more than 10,000 Australians aged 18 to 91. And they were asked questions about the quality of aged care and what they considered the most important attributes of aged care. And there's several that came out as as being very important, including dignity um, for, for, the, for the resident of the aged care facility and so on. 
but they, the interesting thing was that they also asked about people's willingness to pay for better aged care or high quality aged care. And so their, their results um, showed that about 61% of the sample who were um, uh, wage earners were willing to pay more tax to pay for better aged care. And in fact, they found that the, um, the average amount that people thought should be spent on aged care was about double what the government currently spends on it. So there's some interesting results in that report. The problem is, of course, that when, we, when we're asked questions about what we think ought to be done, they don't always reflect what we'd do in practice if we're confronted with a tax increase of 4%, for example. So, um, so I want to talk about a slightly different proposal that I don't think has been considered yet in Australia, but is, is quite um, commonplace in France and to a lesser extent in Israel, the US, Germany, and some other countries, which is long-term care insurance. So there are products available on some markets that basically non-existent in Australia, where you can buy insurance to insure yourself against the risk that you may need at uh, aged care. And this is the important point is that many, but not all of us will require aged care. So it is actually an insurable event. And in the French case, for example, you, the way this works is you buy a policy and you pay a flat premium, which means that basically over time, your premium is declining in real terms. And in fact, after eight years of membership, often the, um, the policy is considered paid up and you get a premium a further premium reduction. So um, one of the questions is how would you use long-term care insurance if you were going to do that in Australia? And I think the answer is that you couldn't apply it immediately to everybody. You'd have to um, bring this in gradually and maybe exempt people who are more than um, less than eight years before retirement, official retirement age. But you could actually introduce policy that um, encourages people to adopt long-term care insurance. And perhaps that could also be done through, say, superannuation packages, the way many of us have uh, disability and um, death insurance through our, our superannuation these days. If that were done from a fairly, fairly young age, not, not necessarily on entry in the work, into the workforce, uh, if that were done at a fairly young age, the premiums would be quite affordable as well. So, for example, in, in the moment in the United States, uh, a 55-year-old male pays approximately the equivalent of $2,100 a month for long-term care insurance. Um, however, you know, if insurance were purchased at age 40, that would be considerably lower. Um, so that, that, would, that could create a, a longer-term um, policy that would ensure that uh, people have enough money when they when they do require aged care not to have to you know sell sell their home or or other assets you could also change the um the conditions under which you don't need to provide a bond so at the moment they're quite generous provisions so you can have a home worth three million dollars and so on and so forth it may be necessary to incentivize people to and this is largely a bequest motive which in france is apparently what drives a lot of the uh, the purchase of this product because in, in France, evidently, under their civil law system, uh, you don't decide who gets your assets when you die. Um, they basically, if, you're, if you have a spouse, that, that spouse gets lifetime use of those resources, but it, effectively the law says that your children inherit the, the resources in general. So um, in Australia, this bequest motive has also become quite a strong motive where people don't want to sell the family home because they want to leave that to their children. But of course, when we make statements like that, we're saying I shouldn't have to sell the assets that I want my children to have in order to pay for my care, especially if I've paid taxes all my life. We need to think more carefully if we're going to try to, if people really do think that we should double the amount of spending on aged care, which is even at the rates Helen was talking about, is not the amount that they're projected to rise by. We probably need to consider some other options that, that for those, who, those of us who can afford it uh, might might be able to take up. Uh, I'll just finish on one further point, which is that, you know, if you do this type of thing, you also have to be very wary about um, the fact that you don't want to create a two-tier system so that one group of Australians get better aged care than another group, but you actually, so you still concentrate on quality and regulation of the, of the market, um, but you also provide some incentives that um, consumers themselves become a bit more sovereign in terms of their choices and their, their distribution of their, their, their dollars in the marketplace in a way that might encourage not only um, better aged care, care, better 
um, more competition to, between providers to improve the quality of aged care. I think I, that's time for me, Helen, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Luke. Um, wow, you, you give us a, a, a way forward for discussion and debate around an area that the Royal Commission clearly indicated was a major contributor to some of the poor outcomes and poor quality in aged care, and that is insufficient funding. So thanks for putting uh, some different models um, for us to consider. Um, I know I've, we've got lots and lots of participants out there, but where are the questions? <laughs> I don't know that you're there unless you go to the Q&A uh, function on the, uh, the Zoom format and either say hi or ask someone a question. So if anything comes to mind, you're very welcome to comment in this uh, section too. Our panelists can see uh, your comments and your questions, and uh, we're very keen for a, a bit more of a dialogue to occur after our speakers. So feel free to, to write freely. Um, okay, now our third panelist um, is Professor Steve McFarlane. Just by way of introduction, over half of people living in residential aged care have a diagnosis of dementia and have complex care needs that are, in the words of the commissioners, often not met. And Steve has spent many years uh, working in aged psychiatry in public hospitals in Victoria and Tasmania, and has merged this experience with a love of big data and a commitment to providing holistic and optimal care for the person with dementia. So delighted to welcome Professor Steve McFarlane to talk about his research. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Helen. And it seems strange to, uh, to preface a talk about quality and person-centred care with a quote from Joseph Stalin, but uh, you'll see where we're going with this as the talk progresses. Uh, the quote from Stalin actually originates from criticisms that were made of his tactics on the Eastern Front during World War II, where he'd throw literally millions of very poorly trained Soviet troops towards the German lines. And uh, they were mown down in their thousands and often prevailed simply by overwhelming German positions with sheer weight of numbers. And when Stalin was asked to defend this strategy about throwing hundreds of thousands of very poor quality troops at the enemy, his response was that sometimes quantity has a quality all of its own. And as far as research is concerned, this uh, quote's intended to show that uh, the use of big data can really produce very, very powerful research conclusions even if the methodology around the uh, collection of each data point is, is less than uh, gold standard. So just to begin with some basic propositions about human behaviour, uh, all of our behaviours, the behaviours that you're all exhibiting at this very moment, have multiple causes that interact and that are very specific to a person. What irritates us is very specific to us. Certain things press our buttons, certain things don't. And that's a universal truth for human behaviour, and it's equally true for those living with dementia. Current management recommendations for people living with altered behaviour in the setting of dementia are universally that uh, non-pharmacological, psychosocially based interventions should be trialled first, and that psychotropic medication should be used as a last resort. And these recommendations came through in the Royal Commission as well. And yet we know from evidence presented to the Commission and elsewhere that the prescription rates of psychotropics for people living with dementia in residential aged care are estimated to be in the order of 50% or greater, whilst only 10% of this prescribing is actually felt to be appropriately targeted. So what are the implications of this real life finding? Do we, do we conclude that in all of these cases where prescribing has occurred, that psychosocial interventions have been trialled and have been shown to be ineffective, so people have ended up, up, up on psychotropics. Certainly the quality of research around the efficacy of psychosocial interventions has been very low, usually involving small sample sizes uh, and with inconsistent and often contradictory outcomes. The problem with doing research around psychosocial interventions, however, is that uh, such research doesn't really lend itself to a randomised control trial or gold standard methodology, because if it's true that the causes of behaviour are highly individual, 
then a trial that is randomised and controlled to examine the effectiveness of a single psychosocial intervention is doomed to fail because you're looking at the treatment of symptoms like agitation. And an analogy might be uh, a randomised controlled trial of penicillin for the symptom of cough is doomed to fail because most cough doesn't have an infectious cause. So the treatment needs to be tailored towards the underlying cause rather than the symptoms. If we accept that the causes of behaviour are individual, uh, we must accept that the way to treat altered behaviour is with an individualised psychosocial intervention program. You can't test such a methodology using a gold standard RCT. And even if you could, who would fund it? Because a pharmaceutical company can't make any money out of it. Uh, the interventions aren't standardised. There's multiple interventions applied simultaneously. So it's a heterogeneous intervention, which is not measurable or describable in the paper that you might write. Very difficult to do RCTs in this area and produce meaningful results. So can big data help in this? Uh, the National Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Service has been in place in some form in Australia since 2007. But in practice, there were multiple different service providers involved. Each state and territory had its own contract with the Commonwealth. As a result, there was no consistent data collection. And it's only since 2016 when we've changed to a single national service provider that we've been able to develop a single national BPSD data set and implement outcome measurement using a standardised neuropsychometric uh, tool, the, the neuropsychiatric inventory in this case. Just briefly, our service model very much emphasises non-pharmacological interventions delivered by a multidisciplinary workforce. We de-emphasise uh, the prescription of psychotropics that so we do uh, utilise a network of geriatricians and geriatric psychiatrists in our work. A typical client would be a male with Alzheimer's disease who's referred to us with multiple different behaviours for which our assessment identifies multiple contributing factors. That's the need for individualised multimodal psychosocial interventions. The role of big data in all this, the, uh, the development of a national database since 2016 has allowed us to essentially produce what's an extremely large case series of people who've been through our services and had their interventions measured using the NPI as an outcome measurement tool. And we've just had this data uh, published in Frontiers of Psychiatry on the 23rd of April, as it happens, and it describes the, uh, the results of our endeavours. Basically, it's a two-year retrospective pre-post study, close to 6,000 referrals from nearly 2,000 Australian nursing homes where we've done pre and post NPIs. And this is where the quantity has, its, has quality all its own, quote comes into its own. A single case study is meaningless, 30 is almost meaningless, 100 you still can't draw robust conclusions from. But when you essentially have a total of almost 6,000 case studies, the data becomes quite meaningful. And when we looked at the pre and post NPI scores across both our programs, DBMAS and SBRT, we saw reductions in behaviour on the NPI uh, with a magnitude of between 60 and 75%. So really very meaningful uh, and clinically robust effect sizes. If you compare those effect sizes to the effect sizes of meta-analyses of various psychotropic medications in treating behaviour in the setting of dementia, of the uh, uh, multiple large studies that have been done on atypical antipsychotics, the average effect size there is 0 0.2. So uh, I guess what our data illustrates is that the uh, the non-pharma interventions, when faithfully applied according to this model, dwarfs that of antipsychotics and other psychotropic drugs for the treatment of uh, BPSD. And that uh, it's research like this could, that can really demonstrate the effectiveness in the real world of multimodal psychosocial interventions that are universally recommended for the treatment of people uh, living with dementia in our nursing homes. Thank you. Wow, that's stunning results, Steve, and nice timing to have it published <laughs> a week before you're presenting it to the, to the world or us online today. Um, you and Nancy need to talk, by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of 
lot of shared uh, ground between you both. Um, so um, our final presenter um, is uh, Professor Liz Eisenring. And uh, there are actually two people on this webinar who've had dinner with Maggie Beer. Um, certainly Liz is one of them um, because she's worked closely with Maggie's foundation for many years. And the other person who's had dinner with Maggie Beer is me, but actually I was just hanging on to Liz's coattails at the time. Um, Liz's research, which is aimed at improving the food and nutritional experiences for older Australians, particularly those living in aged care facilities, is internationally recognised and extremely well publicised. Um, and you will have seen many references to it in the news and um, on commentary um, shows throughout the last couple of years. So delight to have you join us, Liz, and really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you to our other excellent panellists. And I hope that I can then draw all of this together. Um, not that I'm biased at all, but of course, food and nutrition does pull um, all these themes together, I would argue. <laughs> So I will start off with, I guess, the challenges and the not so good, and then I'll end by showing um, some very, um, some of the amazing innovations that we have done in this space. So as Helen mentioned, yes, of course, we know aged care has been in the media a lot recently. And of course, what is one of the most common things that people complain about? It's food. So we've got um, quite a few examples here. So I wanted to start off with that we know, um, we first did some quite large scale research, probably going back 15 years or so ago now, um, in hundreds of aged care residents where we sent in qualified dietitians using uh, standardized assessments and finding that one in two of our aged care residents were malnourished. And by malnourished, we mean it's either because they're not eating enough, the body's not utilizing it enough, um, and not using it effectively. And um, so it's not just due to not eating enough, um, but that certainly complicates things. And why we're so concerned with poor nutrition is that we know those that aren't well nourished have a poorer quality of life, uh, more risk of infections, problems with wound healing, and are the ones that are those frequent flyers between aged care and hospital. So really, um, and and, Unfortunately, in, in that time, our rates of malnutrition really haven't improved that much. And I, of course, I want to highlight there's a huge um, variety. We know some facilities are doing really well, doing some really innovative and have regular checkpoints. But unfortunately, that's not the case across the spectrum. And from the work that myself and my team have done, we've still found that anywhere between about one in four up to one in two uh, people in aged care um, have some challenges in terms of nutritional status. So if you can see from the pictures here, these are some real life examples of food uh, in aged care. And yes, so you'll see plenty of things like pizza and party pies and um, you know uh, chips and all those sorts of things um, because they're cheap and they're um, finger foods and often relatively popular. Um, and while, of course, that's fine now and again, you're probably not that surprised to learn that they're not overly nourishing. Um, we really want to focus on good protein sources and um, make sure we're getting in the vitamins and minerals that we need for good health. I particularly wanted to highlight the little, uh, the photo, the sort of brown mush uh, in the middle, because this unfortunately does happen uh, still very regularly uh, for people who might be on modified texture diets, who might have some problems swallowing and need to have softer foods. Um, of course, and so they do need some feeding assistance, nurses and everyone is very busy. So one of the first things that happens is often they, they mix it all together and it becomes this lovely brownie green mush. Um, and not surprisingly, you know, the resident doesn't eat that much um, because it doesn't look appetizing at all. Um, so moving on, some of the work um, that Sheree Hugo and various people um, around Australia have been involved in is looking at the typical price uh, spent in aged care. And so this is from a couple of years ago now, but at the time um, when we, we published it, oops, it was um, you know, about $6 um, a day uh, spent on food. It's um, bumped up a bit now. It's probably closer to eight from our, our um, last data. But keeping in mind that this is an average and so, yes, of course, some facilities are spending more, but 
Likewise, um, a significant number of facilities are spending less. And while we don't need a huge food budget uh, to do some really nice meals, I don't care how talented your chef is, you know, how qualified you are, if you don't have the food budget, it's incredibly challenging to make appetizing, nourishing and appealing food. So I would argue that that, that is um, certainly a key thing that needs to be looked at and improved. And you know, many people are unaware of the very low spend that is uh, specifically on food uh, in aged care. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, it, it's also, so we can, it, there's so many different links in ensuring from planning, I can plan a beautiful menu that's going to meet all the nutritional requirements of um, our residents, but there's so many links in the chain to actually then get um, the person to enjoy it and eat it and be well nourished. And it's a combination of hospitality and catering, but also from a clinical sense as well, particularly um, if a person might have dementia or physical function uh, challenges with actually opening up um, the meal packaging, for example. But just to highlight that even at the very beginning, if a menu hasn't been designed well, even if the person is eating everything off that menu, it may actually not even meet their requirements. And in fact, a lot of the menus, despite us having standards and recommendations, do not meet the energy and protein requirements of the actual person. And that's best case scenario. That's assuming they're actually going to eat everything they're presented with. As we know, um, many people have uh, taste cha challenges, chewing problems, problems with their teeth, um, you know, dementia, lack of appetite, so many different challenges. So actually, providing from the kitchen all the way to the person uh, to ensuring that they're eating ad adequately is a real challenge. And often there are a few weak links and I'd argue there's probably a few broken links um, also. So I wanted to end up with um, some examples of how we can do better. So if you look down at the three pictures down the bottom left, these are actually um, standards in terms of the different texture of foods for those that might be having swallowing um, difficulties and what we should provide. However, they don't need to all just be little ice cream scoops or little blobs that you know, get turned into that green brown mush. We can actually do beautiful things with plating, with molded foods. We, we're very fortunate in Brisbane, we've got um, Flavour Creations, which is an international company that does beautiful moulded food that looks appetising and still very nourishing and still meets these standards. Um, there's other chefs, as more chefs are moving into aged care, uh, we're seeing you know, their experience and the hospitality side of things move into that setting where traditionally it's been done um, with people perhaps with less, uh, well, with less skills and, and qualifications. So we can do a better job. I also wanted to highlight that, that bit about working to the individual and their preferences. Too often in aged care, it's been done either by an organisation point of view, a budget point of view or a staff point of view. For example, how many people would like to have breakfast at 8 a.m., lunch at 12 p.m., and maybe dinner at 5 p.m.? Uh, that's a huge gap between 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. And unfortunately, there are still facilities that are on that timetable. And that, of course, is due to staffing as opposed to uh, resident. We also have the challenges with um, uh, uh, medication rounds, you know, being done sometimes during meal times and when people already have low appetite, um, you know, to then have to swallow a whole heap of pills before they're about to have their meal um, can put off uh, them actually consuming anything meaningful at all. So these are also some examples. This is all, all this food is suitable um, for a soft diet, uh, people with chewing and swallowing difficulties. But you can see it's beautifully presented. It looks like real food. Sometimes people get too creative and do all these little swirly things. But we have to remember, particularly with people with dementia, the food still needs to look like food so that there's that sense of recognition and enjoyment. So I wanted to highlight that food isn't just about nutrition and nourishing. Um, which of course is an important aspect from our point of view because it's so closely associated with health and well-being and quality of life. 
but it's all those psychosocial things as well. It's sense of community, it's enjoyment, it's cultural. Smells are one of our biggest factors that help trigger uh, memories and sense of connection. So I think that's really important. I wanted to end on one positive note. Um, we, we spoke about the challenges and Nancy opened the with the challenges of COVID. I've seen a few silver linings through COVID in that uh, some of perhaps the staff that weren't fully uh, embedded in aged care have left and I feel there's sort of a fresher side. I've also heard of a few stories where, you know, uh, managers and very senior people in aged care often do a lot of travel, have been stuck in quarantine. And what happens when you're in a hotel in quarantine? Ah, you've got limited menu. Ah, they don't serve food over a particular time of the day. And I think that lived experience, now they can see what's happening to some of the residents and why everyone keeps banging on about food and the dining experience being such an important part of the residence day. And um, yeah, I'd like to close with that, that we can and we must do better and highlight the many innovations that are taking cross taking across Australia and even internationally. And the challenge is we need to make sure that that's the norm and not the exception. Thank you so much, Liz. An another in uh, inspiring and insightful presentation. And I want to thank all our panellists today for tremendous thought that's gone into your presentations and a, a great range of, of insight and expertise shared with us. So thank you sincerely. And thank you to the audience who's uh, sending some questions in now. And just a reminder to those who are a li little bit finger shy, don't hesitate, um, uh, pop in a question for, for our audience. So we might turn to them now. And, and David, lovely to have you join us today, um, Deputy Director of the, of the Centre for Data Science at QUT. And perhaps we can take his first question, panellists, um, as a general one for anyone who wants to respond. But, David's uh, uh, has written, today's discussion is part of the data science in the news series, yes. So might the panelists reflect on the role of data in relation to their topics? Do you, the panelists, have the data we need? Are we at risk of being misled by the data we collect? And what do we need to do to put that data to work? And Steve, you certainly touched on this in your presentation, but this question is open to any of the panelists who who might want to uh, to share their thoughts on it? Yes, yeah, so I can. I'll, I can start the ball rolling, Helen. Um, so I think, in, in relation to what I was talking about, whether you know, the, say, the pricing of a of a viable insurance product, there's certainly uh, data available um, that can be used that's based on current current use of aged care and the, and the cost of that. Uh, there are some other aspects of data in in for this um, group of. Australians that we, you know, it's quite difficult to, to get, um, you know, Steve, Steve gave a really good example of something where, you know, the effort's been put in to collect really good data. And um, certainly there have been some studies of the efficiency of nursing homes, which you know, concentrate on various aspects of what they produce, in, which is care and, and other things. But measuring that quality is not so straightforward. So I think you do need dedicated efforts to um, collect data, and that's really got to got to be from people uh, living in aged care and people who are, you know, their their, their loved ones who who have experience of, of their experiences in aged care as well. So I think it has to be probably in this area a blend of um, both quantitative work and qualitative work. But certainly to price an insurance product, that should be possible with um, currently available data. Uh, the only other thing I'd say about that, the thing is we also need to recognise that people are not on, only living longer, but staying healthy for longer as well. And so when we start to try to project the needs for aged care and, and aged care expenditure, some of those needs may change considerably to, say, home-based care for a, for a longer period of time than previously people might have experienced before going into aged care. Mm -hmm. And we also, I guess, then need to look at innovations that may make longer duration or longer tenure in your own home with support more more readily possible in the future as well and how that would influence um, the use of these these facilities. I guess the, the one thing you could add to that is to say that if you have a long-term care insurance type product, essentially what the person does with that um, payment once they're eligible for it is largely up to them. 
Um, so, so you have some, some sovereignty there, which will then also shape the way that the sector changes, I think, in, in the long run. Excellent. Thank you, Luke. Um, any other um, panellists? Yes, yes, Helen, I'd like to just follow on from what Luke was saying and that the challenge we have in a lot of the allied health field is that, uh, you know, we don't always have agreement on what is the, the best standard measure of things and also it often requires um, technical expertise. However, there are ways around it and we are showing now that a lot of the, the, the stuff that's counted as part of normal food budget or any type of budget um, can be added in. And so one of, I guess, my key recommendations would be include, you know, a minimum data set of some agreed upon uh, standards that can be easily added into things that have already been collected. I also wanted to highlight that, um, you know, as part of the Lantern Project and Cherie's, um, Cherie Hugo's work, they've developed um, something called Epicure, which relies on pattern recognition and qualitative research, which is basically gathering stories. So also, you know, um, touching on from Nancy's point about the example of people gathering stories. So it's talking to residents, it's talking to staff, and by looking at all the key themes coming out, it's actually very good at targeting key challenges and they have um, you know just recently got several thousand data points um, from visiting a couple of aged care facilities and then using it repeatedly over time so I think it ticks quite a few of those boxes that we're saying and I think we do need to be a bit more creative and innovative and standardize with how we do our data collection so that we can make thing uh, make decisions um, effectively from all domains not just from the limited data that we, we often do have, particularly in the area of allied health. And I love how you picked up the links across the, the disciplines and the professions too, Liz. Yes, Steve, um, please go ahead. Yeah, just to expand on the other two answers from my own perspective, uh, I think the original question was, can we be misled by our data? And we certainly can, and that's where big data comes in. The more data points you have, the less likely you are to be misled by them. But it's equally important that we correct the, collect the right sort of data. And I think government has a role here too, because from our experience in setting up these, these national services, the sort of KPI data that the government wanted was the number of visits we conducted, the activity metrics, the sort of questions that they're likely to get asked when they, they go into Senate estimates. They didn't have any requirements upon us to collect clinical outcome data at all. That's something we did off our own bat because we thought it was, was a reasonable thing to try and demonstrate the effectiveness of our service rather than just the activity of our service. So even if government's not asking us for the right sort of information, collecting it off our own bat for the use for research purposes is really valuable. And, and we're in the situation, we've got so much data, we, we don't really have the staff to analyze it. So if there are people out there who are keen to interrogate our database, please get in touch. Uh, I guess another illustration of the sort of data that can uh, prompt unexpected lines of inquiry is after we got this outcome data and we were seeing what had happened to the pe people who had been referred to us, we also had the, the question that arose, what happens to people after they leave our service because we don't have access to them beyond that point? So we, we had a, a look at a subsample of about 250 referrals and contacted the nursing home three months after and found that about a third of the people, like 30% of people who were referred to us who had an episode of care closed, in fact, died in the subsequent three months. And that raised a whole nother area of inquiry about the intersection of abnormal behavior and dementia with this concept of terminal agitation in palliative care. So we've started doing a, a pilot project on that now. So depending on what questions you ask, your data sets, you can get some really interesting answers coming up that prompt new lines of inquiry. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And use every opportunity to um, advertise for, for good postdocs. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, Perhaps I could go to uh, George's question now, because it, it does follow off this discussion that we've just had. And um, it may be that George is happy that we've answered it, but I think there is probably a little bit more to discuss. He, he asks, do you see a role for improved data capture, including automated data capture to develop enhanced models of care for people in residential care, in particular in developing quality indicators for ongoing evaluation. So a number of threads there. Um, Steve, I wonder if you might be best to lead off um, uh, an, an answer or a comment on this question. 
Absolutely, automated data capture is, is very much the, the way to go. Uh, we sort of get around it in DSA in, in a couple of ways. There are mandatory fields on our uh, report writing software that need to be filled in to make sure that certain data points are in fact entered because there's no worse data than junk data. But uh, in, in terms of asking other research questions around aged care, and particularly in relation to psychotropic prescribing, for example, uh, we'd love to be able to demonstrate a decrease in the psychotropic load of uh, the people that we see as well, because that's one of our goals. And uh, until now, the only way we've had of doing that has been manually transcribing handwritten drug charts from the residential aged care facilities, which is very uh, labour and time in uh, intensive. But we're in the process of developing a means whereby we can do automatic data, data uh, transcription through optical character recognition software into our own packages and incorporating that along, alongside automated uh, dose conversion tools so you can get a, a standardised antipsychotic load output in terms of a, a reference antipsychotic, regardless of which agent is prescribed. So those sort of automated data capture processes will uh, aid our, our task immensely going forward. And I think we're on, on the cusp of a revolution in terms of being able to do that. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to use the moderator's access to the microphone now to ask Nancy a question. Oh, <laughs> and then we'll go to some others that have come through on the Q&A. Um, Nancy, how do you, <coughs> how can you cut through the um, decades of traditional ways of care that are so embedded in, in residential aged care facilities? How do you cut through tradition and habit um, to start to bring in uh, new models of care, such as the one you proposed for, for social prescribing, but in fact, you know, any, any new model of care or different way of thinking? It's a vexing question. I mentioned our RSPCA study, and already some aged care providers had been coming to the RSPCA, and we contacted some that said, oh, yes, we're very interested. But when we take our older people out on the bus, they can't get off the bus. Too big a, a risk. So they can drive by the RSPCA and wave at the dogs, but they, they can't actually get off the bus. And you know, my colleagues in the RSPCA, they said, what, what, what? I mean, so I, I, I think that having done a lot of research in aged care, I think that there needs to be, to change that model, it's a, what are you saying when you have people that you're, you're, you're so restricting their basic ability to do the smallest thing? So I think it needs to be beyond person-centered. There really has to be an acknowledgement of those individuals as people. You know, Liz talked about um, executives staying in hotels and realizing meals um, are restricted and that being a light bulb moment. In the United States, there's some really interesting programs where training health professionals, and possibly this could be training managers, live in the aged care facility for a week in order to gain that kind of perspective. So I think there's a perspective taking that's required and a training. A lot of these questions have had to do with research. I think there needs to be training of people working in aged care, that scientist practitioner model of posing questions and then trying to figure out, you know, we can collect some data and get our own answers um, so that they're more receptive to research. I also think we need to train ethics boards to be more cognizant of, less paternalistic of people in aged care while balancing a respect for the people in aged care. So in that last question, you know, big data and automatic capture, it always has to be, rec you know, respecting uh, the person and their, their wishes. So I think there need to be some fundamental shifts because it is quite, it can be quite an entrenched model. Mm -hmm. Well said, um, well said, Nancy, and, and a, a, an insightful, another insightful comment about some of the frustrations through ethics committees and research in aged care. 
Um, Liz, I there's a question for you about the value of lived experience in informing decision makers about the yeah. realities of food I and think, nutrition. Yeah, Nancy touched on that beautifully. About so I I completely agree because I think sometimes there is this disconnect from you know decision makers, and I'll just use you know, the example that we have worked with aged care facilities, worked with their shifts, you know, done the culture shift, really improved, um, improved the menu, improved the food, showed that improved intake, quality of life, um, and say um, either saved money or was cost neutral. So one could argue a very, very successful project. And then what comes in, they have change of management or change of something. And, and suddenly the whole you know, what we've been working on for years, it's, it's all cut and then you have to start from the beginning again. And, you know, from what I understood, it was a, it was a financial um, decision. But, you know, those, those people making those decisions, had they actually visited the aged care centre, had they actually, you know, stayed there, had they eaten, you know, a meal with the residents? So, so yes, I, I absolutely think there is incredible value and, and I think it needs to be. I loved what Nancy was touching on about how other parts of the world that's actually, you know, part of the training. And I do think we need more of it. And I understand, you know, there's so many um, financial challenges and everything else that, that are part of it. But to see successful projects cut over from what I can gather was a financial decision, um, to me seems so short-sighted and obviously very frustrating as a researcher. <laughs> mm, and, and, a terrible, and a terrible outcome for the, the residents and their families. So, yeah, thanks yeah. Liz. Um, Steve, can I um, quickly um, send this last question to you um, and any other comment after, but it's about policy and policy making and, um, and what the perception of data and data science in aged care is around um, developing policy and changing um, some of the, the, the roads that decision makers um, tend to, to, to go down. Um, what are the strengths and limitations? Is that sufficient to encourage data collection efforts on a national scale? Do you have a quickish answer to that or comment? Uh, it's, it's quick, but it's not particularly helpful. I mean, we've, we've got so much data around aged care and we've had so much data for decades, including you know, 10 different inquiries since 2010, all of which have made broadly similar recommendations, all of which has been a largely non-committal response to. So. The data needs to be tempered by pragmatism and politics. Uh, well, it shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. We know what needs to be done. We've had the data. We just haven't been keen to do anything about it. So I think as professionals, perhaps we, we need to be more on the front foot in advocating to government about what the data means and how uh, using it can change lives for the better. Well, if that's not a sentence to close on, <laughs> nothing is. Thank you so much. And it is time to draw um, the webinar to a close. And uh, panellists, on behalf of everyone who's joined today, uh, a huge thank you to you all for your preparation, your participation, and the long lasting impact that your presentations will have, not only on our live audience today, but to um, the many hundreds who then go and visit the uh, Data Science in the News website and download it later. So um, sincere thanks for your expertise and for sharing that with us. Um, I'd also like to thank Professor Kerry Mengerson and QUT Centre for Data Science for allowing QAAS to collaborate um, on this webinar series. And a special shout out to our colleague Amy Rawson for her technical support. Thank you for making it so easy not to make a mistake, Amy. Um, so thanks again, panellists, um, great friends, great colleagues. You each deserve your own university. <laughs> not just Luke, <laughs> or maybe you don't want one. <laughs> um, and thank you to our audience for joining us for the hour. It's been um, great to have you on board. Um, all best wishes go well. Thanks everyone.